Welcome to Watch for the Signs. My name is Jared. All sorts of things going on right now in Ukraine. There was a bridge, a really key bridge that was attacked. Russia attacked civilian targets in Ukraine, including in Kiev. Uh, Russia has chosen uh, a new military commander over this entire campaign. Um, uh, the U.S. to send uh, promises advanced air defense systems following Russian strikes, the, the ones I was just talking about. Uh, Belarus uh, apparently is now getting in on this, and they're going to be directly involved in the war. Uh, what else? Uh, Russian forces are exhausted. They're running out of ammo and resources. Indiana and China um, are upset uh, with this recent attack on Kiev and these other places. And other things. We're going to cover it all. Okay, so first let's start with the bridge. You may have already heard about this, but... Um, this is an interesting happening. So this bridge is actually right here. Okay. It connects mainland Russia to Crimea. You see this right here zooming in. It's this big, long bridge. So you can tell that as far as logistics go and getting supplies and stuff to the war that's primarily taking place along these lines right here, that uh, this is a great way to travel by ground Um as far as supplies go from Russia directly to Crimea and then up into here. Right. So probably one of the main reasons that they chose to attack this, uh, but there's more, it's actually, there's uh, it's kind of a symbolic gesture as well, as you're about to see the attack on the Kersh Strait bridge has highlighted that nowhere is Russia invulnerable. Right. Cause again, look at this, come back over here, look at this map. You know, Ukraine is all the way in the heck over here, right? This is Ukraine. This is also Ukraine, but these are the parts that Russia uh, claims to have annexed and uh, that they have control over right now. So uh, it's kind of like on the opposite side of this war, okay? It's all the way in the heck over here, deep within Russian territory, okay? So kind of significant. Uh, despite heavy security, innovative defenses, and dire warnings of retaliation if targeted, this symbol of Russian pride in engineering, uh, 12 miles long, the longest bridge in Europe, was severely damaged by what Russian, Russia said was a Ukrainian truck bomb. No easy target. The bridge, a strategic supply and logistics artery, not only for Crimea, but also for Russian forces in southern Ukraine, is vital for the war effort and has, therefore, been an obvious target for Ukrainian military planners. Ukraine's Air Force uh, could have attacked it in theory, uh, but would have had to deal with Russian S-300 and even worse, the, the latest S-400 air defense missile batteries that guard the span. Uh, Ukrainian TB-2 drones uh, would fare no better. Their light armament is more suited to taking out vehicles and command posts than destroying sections of reinforced concrete. Okay, so Air Force, not really an option, right? And uh, there's other is issues. Anyway, nevertheless, a large explosion took out a section of the road bridge on Saturday and severely damaged the rail line. With repairs, While repairs began almost immediately, the impact on the Russian war effort and on Russia's psyche was substantial well i mean as far as we know it, it's definitely demoralizing right i don't know if anyone's carried out any study to see what everyone thinks about it but i guess that's kind of a big assumption um but it seems altogether it seems altogether that the russian army is demoralized uh from everything that i've seen okay most most of the logistics supplying russia's southern front uh which are centered around the city of Kurzon run through Crimea. So let's go back here. Here's Kurzon right here. Okay. This is the Kurzon Oblast. So this is one of the four regions that was annexed. Um, and it's just north of Crimea. And the city of Kurzon is over here. And if we go to the uh, Institute for the Study of War, they have some graphics here uh, where you see the... okay. Let's look at this one where, where you see these these green circles, these green and black circles like right here. That, that's kind of let me see if I can zoom out. 
So you see Curzon right here? These green circles, this is where action is taking place. Okay, because it's not necessarily all along these lines. The, the primary things, I guess, that are happening are where these green circles are. So you can see the bridge, you would come through here, go through Crimea, and then up into Curzon. So it's kind of a problem getting supplies. When I was in the army, I was in supply, and the saying goes, bullets don't fly without supply. And uh, that's true. Okay, so <clears throat> let's see. The damage to this vital route will have a serious impact on beleaguered Russian forces already squeezed by a Ukrainian counteroffensive. That's the stage of the war that we're in right now. There's a counteroffensive. Russia is being pushed back. They had taken this territory. You can see the, the blue. Uh, these are areas that Ukraine has successfully uh, liberated and taken back. Okay, so this is what's going on right now. There's some down here. Uh, the yellow, this is claimed Russian control. So I guess it's maybe like in dispute. Anyway, and there is some Russian advance, it looks like. The, this red dotted line, this is assessed Russian advance. So I guess they, they have made some advancements. All right, let's go back here. Um, the damage to President Vladimir Putin himself has been substantial. With much fanfare, he opened the Crimea Bridge himself in 2018, driving a truck across the strait. A close friend and ally built the bridge, and the attack, which came a day after Putin's 70th birthday, oh, I didn't realize that he was that old. Uh, okay, so he's 70. Has many Russians now openly doubting the effectiveness of his handling of the war. So you have demoralized troops uh, back at home. There's all sorts of problems going on there. A lot of people not happy, people trying to escape the war um, and not get drafted. Men are fleeing to all the different countries that border Russia. The hardliners, the, the, the hawks, uh, are upset at the progress of the war, or actually, I guess, uh, more accurately, the setbacks that have taken place. Okay, so that happened in response to that bridge. Russia decided to, I guess, send rockets in. Uh, well, let's just see. Uh, rockets to like these civilian places. Okay, so Kiev. Russia retaliated Monday for an attack on a critical br bridge by unleashing its most widespread strikes against Ukraine in months. So th this is the biggest attack or, or thing of this sort in months. A lethal barrage that smashed civilian targets, knocked out power and water, uh, shattered buildings, and killed at least 14 people. Ukraine's emergency service said nearly 100 people were wounded in the morning rush hour attacks that Russia launched from the air, sea, and land at, uh, at least 14 regions spanning from Lviv in the west to Kharkiv in the east. Many of the attacks occurred far from the war's front lines. And I think that's actually still up on here. Um, at least you have like these these uh, things right here. That, that's uh, like this one, for example. Red alert, aerial threat, sirens sounding, take cover now. This was 10 hours ago. I think that this is around the time that that was taking place. Because you have this one over here in Kiev. What's this symbol? Uh, network data show major sustained impacts to infrastructure across much of Ukraine after a series of attacks by Russia. Energy facilities have been targeted uh, per president's office. Okay. Um, I don't want to play too much with this timeline because it's a little finicky, but you get the idea. You know, air sirens and stuff were going off in all these different places. Okay, so... Let's see. Da, 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 da. Uh, though Russia said missiles targeted military and energy facilities, some struck civilian areas <clears throat> while people were heading to work and school. One hit a playground in downtown Kiev, and another struck a university. Th that's a really uh, sucky situation. <laughs> that really, it's horrible. Uh, the attacks plunged much of the country into a blackout depriving hundreds of thousands of people of electricity into Monday night and creating a shortage so severe Ukrainian authorities asked people to conserve and announce, announce they will stop power exports to Europe starting Tuesday. So 
it was kind of a heavy price to pay, uh, I would think. You know, again, I'm no expert. Uh, it sounds like this bridge can probably be repaired and it wasn't completely taken out, as you can see right here. Let's see, a train caught fire on the railway, railway bridge. And then uh, you see this lane has fallen into the ocean. It says two, two road lanes were partially destroyed. Yeah, these two right here. Uh, heading in, you know, in that direction. So that took place in, it seems to me that this is maybe a heavier toll. The fact that, you know, the power was taken out and then Ukrainian authorities are going to have to stop exports to Europe. So I guess for Russia's part, if you're, if you're going for like asymmetric and whatever, um, maybe that was a good move for them to try and demoralize Ukraine, but I don't know. Um, power outages often deprive residents of water, given the system's reliance on electricity to run pumps and other equipment. So that is a really bad situation for civilians. Okay, now let's talk about this guy. Okay. Uh, Sergei Surovikin, Surovikin, the general, the general Armageddon. That's his nickname, General Armageddon now in charge of Russia's war. Um, I'm not so sure I'm, I'm a big fan of that name or what it implies. Uh, it says, Commander of attack on Ukraine, described as absolutely ruthless, uh, with little regard for human life. And, um, you know, you can't necessarily judge people off of their looks. <laughs> but... There may be some truth to that just by looking at him. Uh, you might get some sense that this is somebody that you don't want to uh, play around with. He, he definitely looks very he looks very Russian and he looks like he's serious. On Monday morning, just two days after being appointed as the first overall commander for the war in Ukraine. So I guess before this point, according to this, there wasn't an overall commander before. So... Uh, which I guess makes sense. Um, anyway, so now so now they have one. So now he's the one over the whole war. Uh, Sorovikin brought his violent Syria playbook closer to home with a flurry of rocket attacks against civilian targets across Ukraine, which included a major road junction next to a university and a children's playground in a park. Oh, okay, so he's the one that that orchestrated this rocket attack against Ukraine. So, and according to this, this is his violent uh, Syria playbook that he's using. Uh, Sorovikin's fir first gained notoriety during the 1991 coup d'etat attempt launched by Soviet hardliners when he led a rifle division that drove through barricades erected by pro-democracy protesters. Three men were killed in the clash, including one who was crushed. So he he was trying to keep the Soviet uh, Union going, <laughs> but so that that's that's what he's all about. Uh, his colleagues have since given him the grim nickname General Armageddon uh, for his hardline and unorthodox approach to waging war. Sorovkin's main challenge, in Ukraine experts say, will be to solve the structural problems plaguing the Russian military as it faces a fierce Ukrainian counteroffensive. Gleb Isra or er, Gleb Irisov, a former Air Force lieutenant who worked with Sorovikin up to 2020, said the new general was one of the few people in the army who, quote, knew how to oversee and streamline many, uh, streamline different army branches. So, I don't know, I guess we'll just see if, if this makes a difference, and this is one of his first things, I guess, is uh, sending these missiles into Ukraine and hitting all these different targets. Um, okay, so to help counter this kind of thing, uh, Biden promises uh, advanced air defense systems following Russian strikes. Okay, so bridge and then strikes, and now Biden is saying we'll, we will give you some air defense systems to help prevent this in the future. Uh, okay, authorities report... At least 11 deaths, more than 60 injured. Targets in several cities hit by missiles, knocking out power. Uh, urgent G7 meeting planned for Tuesday, which is tomorrow. 
UN, UN General Assembly to debate Russian illegal annexation on Monday evening. That's today. So I, I guess that's probably happening as I make this video. Russian President Putin says airstrikes response to Kerch Bridge uh, act of terrorism. So that's how Russia is uh, justifying um, hitting Ukraine. Okay. Russia is open for, okay, quote, Russia is open for diplomacy and the conditions are well known. Uh, the longer Washington encourages Kiev's bellicose mood and encourages rather than hinders the terrorist undertakings of Ukrainian saboteurs, the more difficult will be the search for dip diplomatic solutions, she added. So that that's their position. It's like, okay, we you, uh, this is what has to happen. Um, and if I if I recall, like at this point, it's like you, you need to respect the annexation and then stop hostilities and United States. You need to stop, um, you know, uh, supporting Ukraine, you know, and not just, you know, the United States, but everybody. Uh, Russia illegally annexed several Ukrainian territories at the end of September, but Kiev has previously ruled out ceding any land to Moscow in any potential peace deal. So I guess the big question is, again, how how does this end? I mean, at some point, either they're going to have to do that or Russia is going to have to be hit so hard or depleted to where they just give up. And uh, I feel like that's not going to happen with at least a new without at least a nuclear bomb going off. But, you know, what do I know? Um the regional governor, play, governor played down the prospect of a new top Russian commander altering the course of the war. So, okay. He says, I think it will change nothing because Russian army is very corrupt and weak and they have no motivation. They are the occupiers, he told DW. I get, we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. We'll have to see how he does. Uh, UN slams Russian airstrikes as unacceptable escalation. Okay, so now... The UN is chiming in. The multiple strikes that have targeted cities across Ukraine amount to, quote, an unacceptable escalation of the war. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said, according to his spokesperson, quote, the Secretary General is deeply shocked by today's large scale missile attacks by the armed forces of the, Ru the Russian Federation on cities across Ukraine that reportedly resulted in widespread damage to civilian areas and led to dozens of people being killed and injured. Uh, Stefan Dujaric said in a statement. Um, it, it feels like this has been a type of milestone in the war, uh, the bridge and this response. Um, I don't know, though. I don't know. Uh, the European Union says Russia strike amounts to a war crime. The European Union condemned Russia, Russian missile strikes on Ukraine Monday as, quote, indiscriminately targeting people in a cowardly, heinous hail of missile on civilian targets. End quote. Peter Stan Stano, spokesman for the bloc's foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell, told a press, press briefing the Russian strikes on civilian infrastructure were, quote, against international humanitarian law. The, quote, indiscriminate targeting of civilians amounts to a war crime, he added. <laughs> you guys, this thing just like keeps getting uglier and uglier because everyone on all sides keep packing on uh, these different terms, terrorism, war crime. Um, you did this first. So now, you know, we can do a nuclear bomb. It, it just like it, it keeps like just escalating. You know, from my point of view, you, you tell me what you think in the comments below. Now, look at this. Germany to send Ukraine air defense systems. So not just the United States, but Germany, too. German Defense Minister Christine Lambrecht said Germany will deliver the first four IRIS-T SLM air defense system within days. And uh, there's a picture of it right here. This thing. Looks kind of like a, a camper in the front, but there's a bunch of missiles in the back. Um, let's see. The renewed missile fire on Kiev and the many other cities show how important it is to supply Ukraine with air defense systems quickly, Lambrecht said in a statement. Russia's attack with missiles and drones terrorized the civilian population, the statement added. Uh, what we have 
read about the drones is the drones uh, are only somewhat effective and apparently they're easy to be shot down by Soviet era um, anti-air defense systems. So I'm not so sure how terrorizing the drones are. Uh, We also read recently that they can be heard from miles away, but these missiles seem to have been uh, effective uh, to a degree. Russians, uh, Russia's Putin vows further severe retaliation to Ukraine attacks. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin told a Russian Security Council meeting on Monday that Russia had launched strikes targeting Ukrainian energy infrastructure in response to Ukraine's quote unquote terrorist actions. Putin said this included an explosion that damaged the Kerch Kirk, uh, sorry, Kerch Bridge in Crimea, which Moscow has blamed on Ukrainian special forces. Okay. Uh, he added the Russian response to more Ukrainian attacks would be, quote unquote, severe. So, OK, so if there's more attacks of that, that class or category, then this is what they're uh, threatening. Severe, severe responses. Um, which, which, I mean, I, I don't want to be like naive, but isn't the whole war severe? How about just make the whole war severe to win the war? Um, I don't know. The Russian defense ministry said the goals of strikes on Ukraine's military command and communication facility, facilities and energy infrastructure, quote, have been fulfilled, end quote, without providing details. Ukraine's prime minister, Denis Shmihal uh, had earlier said that 11 major infrastructure targets were hit in eight regions, causing widespread disruption to electricity, water, and communications. All right. I think that's that's it for this one. It's just showing the bridge again. Um, oh, and by the way, Germany, this, this is the, the missiles uh, that they would send to Ukraine. They're relatively new, uh, entered service 2005, range of fire up to 25 kilometers, infrared homing. Um, Yeah, okay. Now, uh, this, I I find this interesting right here. Belarus is now going to be joining these deployments to Russia because up until this point, as far as I know and what I've read, They've only uh, hosted Russian troops. They've served as like a staging ground for Russian attacks into Ukraine, but they have not actively participated in it. But according to this, and I've seen this in a couple different places, Belarus's Lukashenko announces troop deployments with Russia amid escalations in Ukraine. So this is now... So now we're going to have three countries directly uh, at war, you know, two against one. Up until now, it's just been uh, Russia versus Ukraine. Um, You know, unless you're talking about how Russia had recognized Donetsk and Luhansk as their own republics and countries, but that's not really. Uh, For all intents and purposes, now three people or three countries are going to be involved in this war. Belarusian Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko on Monday announced a joint military task force with Russia will deploy to the western border of the country near Ukraine amid a series of escalations in the Ukraine-Russia war. So where is that? Uh, Let's look at this map. So here's Belarus up here. Okay, here's Belarus. All the fighting in the war is taking place over here, far away from Belarus. And it just said, what did it just say? Uh, A joint military task force with Russia will deploy to the western border of the country. Which country? Russia? Uh, Belarus? Maybe Maybe it means Russia. That would make sense because that's over here. This is the western border of Russia. I can't imagine that they would start start coming down through here. It's a little bit ambiguous. I, I'm going to go ahead and assume it's referring to over here, the, the Western Russian border. So maybe Belarusian 
Belarusian, Belarusian troops would come over here with uh, Russian troops. So, okay. Let me just read it. Okay. On Monday announced, a joint military task force with Russia will deploy to the western border with Russia. So, okay, since it says Russia here, it's probably talking about Russia. Will deploy to the western border of the country near Ukraine amid a series of escalations in the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, the Belarusian news outlet Belta reported that Lu Lukashenko and Russian President Vladimir Putin had agreed to the deployment of the troops, which includes forces from both Belarus and Russia. Lukashenko said the task force includes more than a thousand troops and has already begun forming. He also said thousands more Russian troops could soon be deployed within Belarus. Uh, quote, this won't just be a thousand troops, he said, according to the New York Times. I, I guess it begs the question, like, how many? <laughs> uh, how involved are you going to get? Belarus? Like, what? It's just, it's kind of weird. Um, like, Russia's to the point where it's it had to draft 300,000 troops. You know, people that are just like, basically from off the street protests stuff like that not probably not the best uh reinforcements and now i guess they're playing the Belar the belarusian card getting belarus to participate it's just i don't know it, it doesn't it doesn't sound good it doesn't sound like a place that i would want to be if i was russia at this point if i was russia i'd want to have the whole country under control no help from belarus so it 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 just doesn't sound good. Uh, Russia deployed tens of thousands of soldiers to Belarus as a staging ground for its initial invasion of Ukraine in February, and hundreds remained there, launching missiles and air raids. Okay. Uh, during the recent Security Council meeting, Lukashenko also said he was, quote, warned through an unofficial channel, or sorry, warned through unofficial channels about strikes on Belarus from you quote uh, end quote from ukraine without providing evidence um quote they said that it would be the crimean bridge too so these unofficial sources i guess these these rumors that they're getting that lukashenko is getting they're saying hey you know what we did with russia with the crimean bridge this is going to be crimean bridge number two uh, this information was immediately brought to my attention, end quote. The president said, according to another article from Belta, quote, My answer was simple. Tell the president of Ukraine and other insane people, if they are still there, that the Crimean Bridge will, will be just the thin end of the wedge to them. Uh, if only they touch a single meter of our territory with their dirty hands. Those are fighting words. Uh, uh, Sviatlana Sikhanhauskaya, a Belarusian opposition leader, dismissed the claims that U Ukraine possesses, poses a threat to the country. So th this is an opposition person to, what's his name, Shlashenko? Lukashenko. So this is like his opponent. He says, Quote, it's a lie by Lukashenko to justify his complicity in the terror against Ukraine, she tweeted. Uh, quote, he also violates our national security. I urge the Belarusian military, don't follow criminal orders, refuse to participate in Putin's war against our neighbors. You know, in some countries, uh, that well... In any country, I would think that's a very bold and daring thing to say because you could be charged with treason, telling military commanders to not follow orders, right? So I wonder what's going to happen to this person. Are they going to get arrested, put under house arrest, uh, or worse? I don't know. But that's a, that's a daring thing. That's a daring thing. I guess we'll have to see if uh, anyone listens to her. I, I, I just know that if I was Belarus... OK, and I was in the Belarusian army or whatever, I probably wouldn't be too keen on fighting a war that like, what am I getting? What? Why am I doing this? What? We're, we're doing this to help Russia? Like, I don't know. 
there's probably more to it than that, but I can't imagine very many of them would really be up to doing this. Okay, Lukashenko, a close ally of Putin's, has vowed has vowed war if Ukraine attacks his country and hosted Russian troops for military drills earlier this year. So this is kind of a crazy development. We'll see how much of a, a role they play. Uh, BBC News, war in Ukraine, Russia's forces are exhausted, says GCHQ head. Uh, a destroyed tank near Izium in the Kharkiv area of Ukraine, uh, presumably a Russian tank, I don't know. Ukraine is turning the tide against quote-unquote exhausted Russian forces, the head of Britain's GCHQ intelligence agency will say in a speech on Tuesday, tomorrow. Despite the missile attacks on targets across Ukraine on Monday, Sir Jeremy Fleming will claim Moscow is running out of ammunition. That's not a good position to be in if you're in a war. Quote, we know, and Russian commanders on the ground know, that their supplies and munitions are running out. Sir Jeremy will say in his speech at the annual Royal United Services Institute Security Lecture. Uh, he will argue that the mobilization of prisoners and unexperienced men, quote, speaks of a desperate situation, end quote. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> Getting prisoners and just bums off the street? Um, and will also directly criticize President Putin as isolated and making mistakes. Uh, in a speech in March, Jeremy said intelligence had showed some Russian soldiers in Ukraine had refused to carry out orders, sabotaged their own equipment, and accidentally shot down one of their own aircraft. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Okay, India and China. <clears throat> how, how are they responding to this? Okay, this is in response to what they, what, Russia, what they just did to Ukraine with the missile strikes. India and Russia, two powers that have offered Russia some relief in the face of Western sanctions, expressed concern after the deadly mi missile strikes across Ukraine on Monday and renewed calls for de-escalation and dialogue. Mao Ning, a spokeswoman for China's foreign ministry, <clears throat> told a press briefing that, quote, all countries deserve respect for their sovereignty and territorial integrity, end quote, and that, quote, support should be given to all efforts that are con con uh, conducive to peacefully resolving the crisis. Uh, well, remember that, China, that all countries deserve re respect for their sovereignty. Okay, we're looking at you, looking at Taiwan. Um uh, Irindam Bagchi, the spokesman of India's Ministry of External Affairs, said New Delhi would offer support for efforts to calm the fighting. Quote, India is deeply concerned at the escalation of the conflict in Ukraine, including targeting of infrastructure and deaths of civilians, Mr. Bagchi said. As the war in Ukraine has dragged on, President Vladimir V. Putin's continued aggression has put his remaining allies into a difficult position. China and India have increasingly sought to distance themselves from the Russian leader, even as they have avoided directly condemning his invasion on, of Ukraine and continued to engage with Moscow economically, especially by purchasing more Russian oil as Europe has moved uh, to re reduce its imports. So, yeah... Awkward situation for for China and India. Um, in case you're not too sure where that's at, and that's okay. Um, not not everybody is, is good with geography. Here's Russia up here. Here's Ukraine, the fighting that's happening, and then China shares a border with Russia right here in the in the east, and then India is down here on the other side of Kazakhstan and these other. Um, like Muslim countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, so on and so forth. Okay. The last thing that I wanted to look at, oh, probably the last thing I wanted to look at what, um, oh, I guess I need to go back right here. What the Institute for the Study of War had to say. Uh, now, this is as of October 9th, so this was yesterday uh, before this missile strike, but there were a few things I wanted to point out. Uh, Putin is continuing to shuffle his senior military commanders 
uh, likely to deflect blame from himself and to regenerate enthusiasm in the extremist pro-war community. Okay. So it, it says commanders, plural. So I don't know if it's just this one guy that's this uh, Air Force general that's been put over um, the entire war. Right right here it says Army General, but Sergei, yeah, this is the guy that we were talking about before, but uh, we were re I, I had seen other places that he he's an Air Force general uh, Air Force general. Okay, the pro-war community in Russia, of course, is relying on a belief that Serovikin's reputed toughness, so this is that general, will suffice to change the tra trajectory of the war. Um, one mill blogger praised Serovkin as a leader who takes decisive action, quote, heads can fly off shoulders instantly in his command, and he uh, does not stand on ceremony with stupid commanders. Uh, <clears throat> the notion that Sorovakin is tougher, quote unquote, than his predecessor, Army General Alexander uh, Dvor Dvornikov, or any of the other senior Russian commanders, is bizarre. Uh, Dvornikov, like Sorovakin, and all the other Russian military district commanders, served in senior roles in Syria where they fought with extreme brutality. Uh, Dvornikov became known as, quote, the Butcher of Syria. Oh, I think I've heard of him. I recognize that name, that that nickname, the, the Butcher of Syria, for his viciousness uh, with which Russian forces under his command waged war. Okay, so some people are like, well, is this really changing things up because he was just as bad? Okay, Putin cannot do one thing Sorry, Putin cannot do the one thing his hardline constituency demands. Win the war. Well, uh, that's yet to be seen. That's yet to be seen. Um, even if we're, we're pretty sure about that. But let's see why they say that is. Uh, shuffling senior commanders will not fix the systemic problems that have hamstrung Russian operations, logistics, defense industry, and mobilization from the outset of the invasion. Well, uh, maybe. What if they fix the systemic problems? Uh, I know that systemic problems, those are like more deep-rooted, but maybe they can fix some things. Uh, scapegoats can deflect criticism from Putin only for a time, and the appearance of direct criticism of Putin's leadership among his most devoted hardline constituency is likely a harbinger of future dissatisfaction in that quarter. Uh, escalation, either conventional or nuclear, cannot solve uh, Putin's problems. Uh, but presumably, we, it's hard to say how people are going to react to that in in how many he might use. Cause for all anybody knows, what if he uses instead of just one, what if he uses three? What if, uh, even though Ukraine is advancing, you know, they know that, uh, they can't stand up to nuclear bombs. What if Russia is crazy enough to do that? Be like, okay, you want to keep uh, going? Well, guess what? Nuclear bomb, nuclear bomb, nuclear bomb. You want to keep going? Okay. Nuclear bomb. And, um, the way that I see the rest of the world respond you know, it's with like sanctions. And again, I'm kind of skeptical of saying you tell me in the comments, though, if you know, I know that there's probably sometimes that sanctions are somewhat effective. But when it comes to like things that countries really, really want, it doesn't seem like sanctions really stop those kind of problems like what we're seeing here. So I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking outside the box. I'm just thinking of things. I don't like I don't I don't like statements like this where you're like claiming that you know what's going to happen because it's been my life experience. It's very hard to predict the future in anything, <laughs> even for experts. So okay, but whatever. Okay, if Russian forces are able to expand their attacks against Ukrainian population centers or critical infrastructure, or if Putin is willing to use tactical nuclear weapons against Ukraine, he can only hope thereby to stop the Ukrainian counteroffensive for a time. 
Uh, such attacks will not allow his forces to conquer Ukraine and achieve the objectives that extreme pro-Russian nationalists demand. Uh, they may they may well trigger Western responses that Russian hardliners would see as validating their arguments. Well, I mean, what kind of responses? Um, I just I have a hard time viewing anyone in the West wanting to get engaged, e- even if things go nuclear. Um, like I, I could see a situation where if like Russia only uses uses like one or two nuclear bombs, like the West will still be like, well, we're gonna take decisive action and we're going to slap you with sanctions. We're not kidding. Um, just because, I mean, you have to think, is, is it worth it? You know, if Russia was going to like, then move on to other countries, like, um, let's go to the map. If they were then going to go on to Latvia, Estonia, uh, Finland, then, maybe it might be worth it to, to like take military action, direct military action against Russia. But over Ukraine, is it, is it, is it worth world war three? And I'm thinking this is how the West probably views it. I, I don't know. I don't know. Is it worth world war three over Ukraine? Maybe if Russia starts going other places, um, Maybe not. So, like, say, like, what if Russia uh, deploys nuclear bombs, hits a few cities here, demoralizes Ukraine, um, and kind of forces them into a situation where they have to um, acknowledge the annexation? Well, maybe that's where it ends, you know? And then the world is in a new situation where, well, you can use nuclear bombs like that and take what you want. I don't know. I, I I might just be really ignorant in these things, but okay. So, um, according to the Institute for the Study of War, such attacks will not allow his forces to conquer Ukraine and achieve achieve the objectives that extreme pro-Russian nationalists demand. They may well trigger Western responses that Russian hardliners would see as validating their arguments. Like, yeah, see that they, they want to invade Russia. They they're they're wanting war against Russia. So this uh, this war was justified in the first place, uh, but at the cost of devastating Russia's remaining military power and ability to achieve anything of real value. Uh, what could what could happen if Putin loses the support of the constituency most committed to his vision? It's hard to say. So that's where we're at as of um, Monday night, uh, October 10th. Some crazy things are happening. More escalations. Uh, Belarus now, I guess, joining in. Uh, the bridge incident, and then the response on civilian areas. Um, new commanding general uh, of the of the war effort. Just I don't know. Just watch it day by day, and we'll see what happens. Okay, that's gonna be it for this one. So, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.